All right, everybody, so um, let's get started. Today we'll talk about preprocessing and feature transformation and building pipelines with scikit-learn. Before we get started, a couple of announcements. Uh, so first off, a couple of you were not able to link your classroom, uh, GitHub classroom to your uni. That's totally fine for the submission of this homework, so don't worry too much about it. <coughs> However, if your uni wasn't on GitHub Classroom, please send me an email so I can add you and so I can fix it. But uh, your submission will totally be fine. Um, yeah, just for all homework, uh, it's important that you submit both on GitHub Classroom and on Gradescope. The new homework I'll post this afternoon. So homework two will be out this afternoon and it will be about like doing some basic supervised learning with scikit-learn. Um, and then finally, so I just posted a new policy for Piazza. Um, a lot of you have been posting duplicate questions and it's really hard for the TAs to catch up if there are so many duplicate questions. So the new policy is if you ask a question has been asked before, you lose one point on the homework assignment. This is like one out of 100, but <laughs> hopefully to discourage you from asking duplicate question. Students tell me, well, but there are so many questions already. The reason why there are so many questions is because you're asking so many duplicate questions. And th th that is true, right? The other thing is um, asking good questions is really, really important in any programming related activities. So like Stack Overflow is an amazing resource or bug trackers or issue trackers and all of these rely critically on you asking very precise questions and giving the questions good names and making them searchable. So I want you to practice that. A lot of the questions are very hard to find in Piazza because they have bad names or maybe the question is asked in an unclear way. So in Piazza, I link to the guides for Stack Overflow, which are pretty good on how to ask a question. This is a really, really important skill um, to practice. And so if you start working at a company and you ask ba bad questions, you will look really, really bad. So please practice asking good questions. It takes some time to work on it, but it's, it's really an important skill. Okay, so that was my rant for today. And um, so now I wanna talk about uh, pre-processing and feature engineering. I wanna start with a brief quote from uh, Andrew Ng. He crops up more than I anticipated. Um, so pre-processing and feature engineering are made one of the most critical aspects of doing machine learning. So he said, coming up with features is difficult, time consuming, requires expert knowledge. Applied machine learning is basically feature engineering. And I think this is still true. And um, deep learning sort of changed a little bit the nature of what feature engineering means, but it definitely didn't get rid of feature engineering. So processing your data in the right way is really critically important for many machine learning applications. Today we'll only go about uh, over like the very basics and maybe uh, we'll go over more advanced uh, feature engineering a little bit later in the semester. The running example that I want to look at is this data set here from the, this is King, Con King County uh, house prices. So these are house sales uh, from the area around Seattle, including Seattle. Um, there is, I think, 17 features, well, actually 18, but, um, for uh, houses that were sold, like the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, the um, square footage of the living area, the square footage of the lot, and so on. And uh, so each of the X axes here shows a feature, and each of the Y axis shows a price. And there you can see like expected trends, like, um, Bigger places are more expensive. Um, newer places are slightly more expensive, to, sort of. Um, and um, there's also some structure in latitude and longitude, so that's not very obvious. Probably, if you would, uh, if you would overlay this on a map similar to the homework, you might see more structure. So when you look at these features, you can see they are like quite different in many aspects. Um, so there's discrete and continuous ones. Um, they have very different scales. If you look at the scale of the x-axis, the number of bathrooms is mostly between zero and six, while the square footage of the lot 
is like between zero and a million, 10 million square feet. So these are very different orders of magnitude. And they also all have different distributions. So the square, uh, the square footage of living is, uh, looks like it's probably a skewed distribution. I don't know, bedrooms might be normal or not. It's a little bit hard to say. Um, but so you can see they're very different in, in many aspects. The first thing we will talk about is scaling. And like, it seems maybe like kind of trivial, but it's quite important. So if you look at the box plot of this data, you can see again, they, they have very different um, ranges. So this here is a log plot. So um, if anything's higher here, it means it's higher by like orders of magnitude. And so there are some things like the bathroom, this is like five orders of magnitude or four orders of magnitude at least uh, smaller than the square footage. And whether scaling of the data matters um, depends on the learning algorithm. I wanna give a quick example with the algorithm that we saw uh, last time, which is Kenyer's neighbors. So here I plotted my favorite toy data set um, in two dimensions. Again, one feature the x-axis, one on the y-axis. Uh, we have two classes, blue and red. And on the left-hand side, uh, there's a, a version of the data where the x-axis has a much more, um, much wider range of values than the y-axis. And then there's a version where I scaled it. And I scaled it by doing zero mean unit variance. So now let's apply um, Kenyer's neighbors uh, classification to this problem. So the data sets look, ide uh, um, look identical except for the axis labeling, right? So you would assume that the results are quite similar, but that's not the case. So here is the results of doing uh, Kenyer's neighbor algorithm without scaling and with scaling. Because the um, Kenyer's neighbor uses Euclidean distances, the uh, differences along the x-axis without scaling are much, much bigger. So, let me see. So the difference between this and this in the x-axis is like maybe a, th a thousand, or no, not a thousand, but like several hundred. While on the y-axis, it's only seven. And so, a hundred is much bigger than seven, so basically they're very far apart in the space, even though it doesn't look like this in the plot. And so um, many, many algorithms are actually very sensitive to scaling. Um, so distance-based algorithms like this, or like uh, kernel SVMs, like neural networks, algorithms that are not sensitive to scaling are most tree-based algorithms. All right, so how are we gonna scale the data? There are several different ways to scale the data. Again, I'm doing a 2D example here, where on the left-hand side, we see the original data, which is somewhere in the like, top right quadrant. The most common way to scale the data is to zero mean unit variance. Or maybe, let me just get back uh, for a second. So, I mean, one of the reasons this is like, the left-hand side is really weird, um, is because, assume these are physical measurements and they have units. If you change the unit, you would change the numbers. So if instead of square footage, I would use square miles, the number would be completely different and the outcome of the algorithm would be completely different. You don't want your algorithm to give you a different result if you use square footage versus square miles. They're, they should be equivalent, right? The units should not dictate the outcome of the algorithm. So that, 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 I think, is a very clear motivation for doing scaling. All right, so one standard way to scale is zero mean unit variance in scikit-learn that's implemented in the standard scaler. So that just computes the mean of the training data, subtracts the mean of the training data, computes the sound deviation, divides by the sound deviation. Um, this is by far the most common and it makes sense for sort of blob-shaped data. Uh, another very common method is the min-max scaler that scales every feature between a minimum and a maximum value. Usually this is e either zero and one or minus one and one. Uh, that's implemented in the min-max scaler. This is useful for features that have very clear boundaries. 
So if you have like a Gaussian variable doing min-max scalar might not make a lot of sense. If you have a variable that has like clear, a clear minimum and maximum, then the standard scalar might make, not make that much sense. And so these are sort of the two main, uh, main scalars that people use. There's a couple other ones, particularly the robust scalar I think is interesting. Um, so standard scalar works on mean and standard deviation. Um, and the problem with mean and standard deviation is that if you have outliers, say a measurement error, they can move the mean standard deviation uh, arbitrarily much. So let's say you have one measurement error of a point that's like really far away. If it's far away enough, it can make your mean be anything. Like a single outlier point can change your mean standard deviation by any amount. And so that might really skew with the meaning of any of the features. And so um, what the robust scalar does instead is use median and uh, quantiles or interquantile ranges. So it makes the, I think the, the interquantile range be one and the uh, median be zero. So it's, this is what's called like robust statistical measure. So it's robust uh, with respect to outliers. In a sense, you could uh, always use the robust scalar instead of the standard scalar. However, um, the way it's parameterized right now in cycle is like slightly weird because um, if you make the interquantile range be one, then it's not the same as standard deviation one. So basically, if you apply it to a Gaussian, you would want both of them to get the same result, but right now they don't give you the same result. They're off by a scaling factor given by the quantile, interquantile range of a Gaussian, which is slightly weird. Um, but yeah, but this is sort of a, a good idea if you assume you have outliers in your data, or if you don't know. And then finally, another way to scale that is much uh, more rarely used is the normalizer. So the normalizer is um, different from the other ones in that it doesn't uh, scale on a per column basis. So each of uh, the other works on each individual column, zero mean unit variance or minimum and maximum. The normalizer works on rows. And um, in the standard uh, form here, it basically does a projection on the circle, as you can see. And what this means is that it divides by the length of the vector. So each row is divided by its Euclidean length. Another variant of this is divide each row by the sum of absolute values. So this is either L2 normalization if you use Euclidean distance or L1 if you use the sum of the absolute values. This is often used if the different features represent different counts in say a histogram. And if you don't care about the overall amount of counts, but if you only care about um, the relative frequency, like let's say you have like feature one is a uh, count from event A happening, feature two is a uh, count of event B happening, and you don't care about how much A and B happened, you only care about, about what's the relative frequency of A and B. And that's a projection to a circle. So that's used commonly for count data as in, um, natural language processing, for example, but outside of that, it's not really used. There's uh, one more consideration when thinking about how to scale your data, which is sparse data. So sparse data is data that has many zeros. Um, this is, again, this is very common in natural language processing, but also if you use any hashing tricks or if you have just like many, many user IDs or something like this. Um, so usually sparse data is data that is, uh, so, has so many zeros that you can't store all the zeros. So you store only the non-zero entries. So you might have a matrix that's like um, a million times 10 million with 10 million features, but actually for each instance, there's only three features that are non-zero. So if you would want to store all of the zeros, this would never fit into memory. And so the problem with this is you cannot subtract the mean because if you subtract the mean, and the, then all the entries are gonna be non-zero. Um, and so then basically, if you have a sparse matrix, you wanna subtract the mean, then um, it will become a dense matrix and um, your computer starts swapping and it will crash. So there's um, kind of two solutions to this. One solution is 
imp uh, like change your algorithm so that the algorithm internally pretends that the mean was subtracted. Uh, I don't think that's actually, uh, maybe that's implemented in some of the linear models in cycle. No, not, not entirely. But you could in principle do that, but it's not really done in cycle learn that much. The other way is basically don't subtract the mean and do a different way of scaling. Um, so one way to do this is use the max app scaler. The max app scaler, scaler basically just scales each feature so that the maximum absolute value is one. So it tries to do something similar to scaling by the standard deviation, only basically it keeps the zero fixed. So yeah, if you ever encounter sort of sparse data, use the max app scaler. The standard scaler will probably uh, even warn you and say it's not going to do anything for you. So how will we implement this with scikit-learn? Um, here's an example on the King Country uh, house prices. So I'm going to use a couple of models today during the lecture. For example, rich regression, which is a linear regression model. Think of all of these just as black boxes for now. If you're familiar with them, great. If not, we're going to explain them like uh, next lecture and in the next couple of weeks. It doesn't really matter so much that you know the internals of the algorithms, just sort of think of them as black boxes. So I start by splitting my data into training and test set. Um, this, the standard scalar is again, it's an estimator, like all estimators in cycle learning has a fit method. I instantiate the class, I call fit on the training data set. And then there's a different method, the transform method. The transform method is used to uh, actually scale the data. So calling transform will subtract the mean as, and uh, divide by standard deviations. So, and it will produce the scaled data, which I call X train scaled. So transform is used whenever you want to generate a new representation of your data. Then I can fit the rich model uh, using the scaled data and the train targets. And then I can uh, transform my test data set and evaluate the model on the test on the scale test data set. So this is sort of a standard process for doing scaling and then building a supervised model with scikit-learn. Um, this is kind of a little bit verbose. We'll go to a slightly less verbose uh, version in a little bit, but um, scikit-learn always asks you to be very explicit. So today we'll see a couple examples where scikit-learn asks you to do everything very explicitly. So there's going to be no pre-processing done for you automatically. You have to do everything by hand, which can be a little bit annoying if you do like very fast prototyping, but it's quite useful if you want to do um, pr build production systems. So if you really want to know what's going on. So one thing that's important is that we call fit only on a train data set and transform on both the training and the test data set. What that means is that I subtracted the mean of the tra training set from both the training and the test set. And I want to give a quick explanation of why this is important. Again, I have like a beautiful two-dimensional data set. Uh, now in blue, I have the tra training points and in red, I have the test set. If I uh, fit and trans uh, fit on the training set and then transform both the training and the test set, the data set looks exactly the same. So in this case here, the scalar I used was the min-max scalar. So now basically the blue points are scaled in such a way that the minimum and the maximum are zero and one. The red points are scaled in exactly the same way as the blue points, which makes the left and the center plot look identical, except for the ticks. If I would, again, fit on the test set separately, uh, which is sort of a common mistake, then uh, you would scale data such that the minimum and maximum on the test set are also zero and one. If you do this, you effectively apply the different transformation between training and test set, and you moved around the, uh, the red points relative to the blue points. And so you can see the structure that you had on the left-hand side in the original data is not the same as the structure on the right-hand side. So never ever do this. Basically, never ever call fit on the test data set. It will always mess you up. Oh, 
maybe I should say, so the fit transform method here is um, just a shortcut to call fit and then transform on the same data set. Okay, just to very briefly recap um, the API that we just saw. So everything in scikit-learn has a fit method. It always gets the data matrix X. And uh, if it's a supervised model, it also gets some target variable Y. There's a predict method, which is used for classification, regression, and clustering. So basically always when you get out a single column, usually that is like a labeling of the data in some sense. And there's a transform method that's used uh, whenever you want to get a new representation of the data, a new view of your data. So this is something that looks like X, usually has multiple columns. So that's used for pre-processing, dimensionality reduction, feature selection, and feature extraction. So now we can uh, look at the effect of, um, of scaling. Um, this is on the King Country housing data set, so on the house prices again. And um, I'm looking at two different models, rich CV. So rich CV um, is rich with built-in cross-validation, which automatically tunes uh, some hyperparameters for me. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it on Monday, I think, but basically it's just, I use rich CV to automatically tune my hyperparameters instead of writing it like a big bird search CV and so on. If I use this on the original data, I get an R square of uh, around, uh, well, of like 0.694. If I do it on the scale data, I get basically the same. So for this algorithm, um, scaling didn't really change anything. However, if I use the k-neighbors regressor, then I can see that uh, I go from an R square of 0.5 to 0.786. So it goes from being quite a bit worse than the linear model to quite a bit better than the linear model um, just by scaling the data, because this algorithm is really, really sensitive to the scaling of the data. Um, so in theory, at least, uh, Rich could also be sensitive to the data, but it's not in this case. And anything that really is distance-based, like k neighbors, neighbors um, is usually more sensitive. All right. so. Scaling worked for our distance-based algorithm. However, I did something here was, which is actually not, not great. The way I use cross-validation here is like a little bit dicey. And that's the thing I want to talk about next. So uh, pre-processing is usually part of a bigger machine learning workflow. And um, scikit-learn has this tool called pipelines that will allow you to put together pre-processing methods and supervised learning models into uh, a single workflow. And I want to talk a little bit more about the motivation behind this. There's a very common error in pre-processing, uh, which I illustrated here. So let me talk you through this. So let's say you have a data set that has 100 samples and 10,000 features. And maybe you think, oh wait, that's way too many features. I need to have less features. So you're going to take a feature selection method. I'm not gonna, I don't want to talk about the feature selection method too much right now. We have a separate lecture on that. But basically, let's say it gives you the most 5%. You select the most uh, informative features. And you select 5% of the most informative features. So I fit it on my data, and then I transform it. And now I have x selected. x selected now has 500 features. And I think, OK, this is much better. This is something that. People have done in a lot of papers. This is something in particular in biology and medical sciences. This is like a very common pattern, and it's terrible. So now let's say I take my, uh, my model, uh, my rich model. It's, again, my linear regression model. I call a cross -file score on, um, with, with rich and the selected features and uh, the target y. And it gives me an R square of 0.9. So one is the best that so tells me, wow, this model is doing like an amazing job. OK, so I talked about like just doing cross-validation is not enough when you do um, parameter uh, searches. But if you just evaluate one model, cross-validation should be fine. This should give you an unbiased estimate of 
how well you model this. So now you think, okay, this model is amazing. I solved the problem. Okay, now um, you collect some more data. Um, I call it X-test. And I scored a model that I built on uh, before. So I built a, mo a new model uh, on the whole like training data set. Um, and I test this model on the new test set and it completely breaks. So negative R square means it's worse than chance. So cross validation told me this model is really good, but then I have, then I get some new data and it tells me it's really bad. Does anyone have an idea of what's happening? Okay, so the problem here is that I applied the feature selection before I, uh, uh, outside of the cross-validation loop. So here I wrote down what is basically happening uh, on the left-hand side as the bad example. So what I did is I called, um, I fit my model on the data set. This figures out what are the best, uh, the best features. And then I um, call transform. And then this is actually the internal API of scikit-learn, but I think it's pretty readable. So for each split in my, like say, five-fold cross-validation, I fit the model on the training data set and I evaluate it on a test set. However, the part that is used as the test set here was already used, oh my God, there's a typo here. So there's also a Y in fit. Um, damn it. Okay, there definitely needs to be a Y in fit. Um, so um, the part that is the test set was already in the call to fit there. So part of the model, the pre-processing part, has already seen the test set. That's really bad. So this is called leaking information. Part of my modeling process has already seen the test set and has extracted information from the test set. Now my cross-validation estimate is no longer any good. Turns out the data that I uh, gave it was actually completely random noise. So there should be no possible way to predict it. Um, but still, like if I do it basically this way, it tells me it finds an amazing model. The right way to do this would be to um, do all the pre-processing within the cross-validation loop. So for all splits of my data set, I fit the uh, uh, feature selection only on the training part of the data, then I transform the training part, and I fit on the transform training part. So here you can see I fit only on the training part for each of the splits instead of fitting on the whole data set. And that is what makes all the difference. And so, as I said, this is like a thing that happens a lot and people do this and it leads to completely wrong results. Um, and so this tool, the pipeline that I'm gonna talk about, basically allows you to do the thing on the right, the correct thing, and not make you do the thing on the left, which gives you terrible results. This result is, um, this case is particularly extreme because it uses feature selection. Feature selection allows you to leak a lot of information. Um, I'm gonna go back to scaling the data. In scaling the data, in principle, it's like maybe not entirely as bad, but it's still bad practice, and you should always do all the pre-processing within the cross-validation loop. All right, so let's see how we can do this with the pipeline. So again, the um, King, uh, King's Country housing data set. So the process I showed you before is I instantiate the scaler, I fit on the train data set, I transform the train data set, I fit the ridge on the scaled train data set, I transform a test set, and I score on a transform test set. This exactly the same functionality I can get by a pipeline by saying, make a pipeline out of a standard scalar and ridge, fit the pipeline, and score the pipeline. So these sort of three lines are equivalent to the five lines or six lines above. So that's much nicer. Also now, 
everything, the whole processing pipeline is encapsulated in this pipe object here. So what does this pipeline do? Let's say, assume we have like two pre-processing steps that are called T1 and T2 for transformer one, transformer two in a classifier. If I call pipeline.fit on this, what will happen is it will call fit with the original data on T1, then transform the original data X to get, give me some X1. I'll fit T2 using X1 and then transform X1 to get X2. And then I will fit the classifier uh, using X2. So basically I'm just pa uh, keep transforming and passing uh, through the pipeline. Then if I call predict on the pipeline for some new test data set X prime, I call T1.transform on X prime, I get some X prime one. I call T2. Transform on X prime one, get some X prime two, and then I apply predict uh, for the last step. And the same is true for score. So this is sort of, this is just the thing that you would expect to happen uh, in a sense. And it allows you to write more concise code. Also, it allows you to um, avoid the mistake that we made earlier in cross validation. So I gave you like the examples of the uh, the how to do, do cross validation bad and how to do it correctly, and so doing it ba uh, badly is call fit on ooh, on um, with the whole data set before transform and then pass it to cross validation. So that's no good. But you can do everything within the cross validation loop by first creating a pipeline and then. Um, putting the pipeline into the cross-validation. So here, I'm using like a slightly different syntax. Um, I think I'm gonna talk about this in a second. Um, I create a pipeline that has both the feature selection and the rich regression, and I put this into the cross-validation, and now I get the correct result, which is it's impossible to learn this data. And so, if you ever do the thing on the left, stop doing the thing on the left, do the thing on the right. So there are two ways uh, to build pipelines that I just showed you. One with make pipeline and the other one by directly calling the pipeline class. So make pipeline is a little bit shorter and that's what I usually use. Uh, make pipeline allows you just to give it a sequence of, um, of estimators. Um, all of them have to be a transformer, except for the last one, the last one can be anything. So if you want, the last one could be a transformer, but it can also be a regressor or classifier or anything. And then you can look at the uh, steps. The steps are the actual um, well, steps of the pipeline. And um, there are tuples which have like a name and a class, or the name and the actual object. If you call make pipeline, it will generate the names automatically by just using the lowercase class name. So you can see here, it's auto-generated the name standard scalar for the standard scalar. If you want to give, provide um, custom names, then uh, you can use the pipeline directly. The pipeline uh, um, API is a little bit more verbose. So the pipeline you provide with a list, and it's a list of tuples and the tuples are the name you want to give, which is, which is a string, and then the estimator. So you can either use make pipeline, which is short, and it will make names automatically, or you can give names by directly using pipeline. Yep. Is that a list of tuples or a tuple of tuples? Oh, I, I gave it a tuple of tuples here, but I think internally it's actually converted to a list. So it doesn't matter. I think, it, I think now we, have, it's an iterable of tuples, but there was a bug about this. But I think both list and tuples should be fine. <coughs> All right. One more important thing to know about pipelines is how they integrate with grid search. So let's say I have a pipeline out of a standard scalar and a K neighbor regressor, because we learned always scale your data before using a neighbor based algorithm. Um, now I want to do a grid search over the number of neighbors on this pipeline. 
there's speci uh, specific syntax for this in scikit-learn, which is that you have to define the parameter grid using the name of the step you want to tune. So in this case, it's the lowercase class name, which was automatically generated by makePipeline. Then the double underscore, and then the name of the parameters. So this double underscore is sort of the special syntax for searching sub-estimators of other estimators. So in this line, the steps of the, in this case, the steps of the pipeline. And then I can call um, or construct grid search CV with my pipeline and my parameter grid, and I can fit it and it will do everything correctly. And then the end tell me the best parameter is um, k neighbor regressor and neighbors uh, set to seven. So this is kind of cool. Um, and you can go a little bit wild with that if you want to. So I'm gonna, there's gonna be many models appearing now. Don't worry too much about the model. Just worry about what you can do with pipeline grid search. So here I'm, I'm uh, using a different data set that's uh, much smaller. It's called the diabetes data set. It's built into scikit-learn. Um, don't worry too much about the data set, but uh, so let's say I wanna make a pipeline that's more complicated. I'm scaling the data, then I'm adding polynomial features, which adds all interactions and the square for each uh, feature by default, and then a rich model. So now I have a pipeline of length three. It has scaling, polynomial features, rich. And now I can not only um, tune the parameters of rich, which is alpha, we'll talk about this on Monday. I can also tune the parameters of the polynomial features. So let's say the degree of the polynomial features I want to add. So I can search over the parameters of the pre-processing steps as well as the model. So this way I get like a much bigger grid search because uh, you get the product of all the combinations. So in this case, I would have six times uh, three is uh, 18, I think, and uh, times five for cross-validation, so you have uh, 90 models to tune, or sorry, 90 models to uh, fit for running the grid search. You can go even wilder than this. You can use grid search in pipelines to um, change what steps you want in your pipeline. So here I made a pipeline I call the steps scalar and regressor, and I can now say, well, the scalar, I want to be either the standard scalar or the min-max scalar or pass-through. Pass-through means it's like a do-nothing identity transformation. And the regressor, I want to be either rich or lasso, which is a different linear model. And then for the uh, regressor, I also want to tune alpha. So, it's not, not necessarily a, a good idea to do giant grid searches over everything that's possible um, because it takes longer and longer and you're more likely to overfit. But you can definitely do it if you want to. You should think about what do you actually want to search, but the possibilities using pipelines and grid searches actually, um, they're pretty broad. And we can go even uh, wilder. Um, turns out grid search doesn't only allow you to specify grids. The, the param grid doesn't actually need to be a grid. It can also be a list of grids. So again, I have a pipeline with two steps, a standard scalar and a regressor, or like a scalar and a regressor. And so now I define um, my param grid to be a list of two grids. In the first grid, the regressor is always a decision tree. The scalar is always passed through because decision trees don't need scaling. And I'm searching with the max depth. In the second grid, my regressor is always rich. Then I check, tune the hyperparameter alpha. And the scalar is either standard scalar, min max scalar, and pass through. So if I provide this parameter grid to grid search CV, it will search over all of these. So it will tell me is a tuned uh, decision tree better or is a tuned rich better? And with which scalar is it better? So it will basically do like the whole model search for you. Um, often it's a good idea to do be more hands-on and like evaluate in more detail what you're doing 
but you, you can do it if you want to. Well, the point, so the reason why I use two dictionaries, not one dictionary, is that they would be invalid com uh, combinations because ridge doesn't have a max depth parameter and the tree doesn't have an alpha parameter. That's why I wrote it this way. Oh, the, and that's actually, these invalid combinations are like a little bit annoying to write down. There's a tool called search grid, um, which helps you to make this a little bit easier. Um, if, if you're into that sort of thing. All right. Um, that was everything about pipelines so far. Any questions about pipelines and grid searching pipelines for now? Yeah. So I'm a little confused. So when you combine the pipe with the parameter grid, the pipe has um, a regressor list that is ridge, but then it's passed through a regressor with a decision sheet tree regressor. How do those things combine? Okay, this is a very good question. So this thing here is basically just a placeholder and will never be used. <laughs> so I just say um, create a pipeline with two steps. And then here I actually say, well, but I want the regressor to be this thing. Or I want the regressor to be this thing. So the, the original value is actually never used. Um, unfortunately, I cannot create a pipeline with, without this in there because then grid search will tell me it can't score the pipeline unless there is something in there in the last step that gives me a score method. Um, it's, like, it's like an annoying thing in the API. It's like a little bit unclean, but yeah. So basically at the top, these are just placeholders. And whatever you have as a step replaces whatever's in there. I mean, I think it's probably, so maybe let me repeat the question. Um, the question is, is it enough to do grid search if we have so many combinations? And it's a very valid concern. Um, it depends a little bit on your data set size, I would say, but also you could do like, this is maybe a case where you can do the uh, repeated K fold. So you could spend more work in the cross validation so you overfit less during the cross validation by doing more repetitions. I mean, you should always have a test set um, I didn't put, I mean, so the last line says we evaluate on a test set, right? Um, if the result on a test set is really bad, that means you overfitted on the, uh, during the cross validation and then uh, because you already looked at a test set, you're kind of in a bit of a pickle. But um, so definitely, th this is the main downside of doing such a big search is that you can overfit during cross validation. And like, Doing more, like doing more repetitions in the cross validation is one way to protect against that. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is going back to our uh, overall theme of pre-processing a little bit more is categorical variables. And um, so right now scikit-learn also requires you to be very explicit about how to treat categorical variables. So here I want to, just as an example, um, have a toy data frame with a data set that I made up con uh, consisting of a database of users that have associated a borrow, uh, a salary, and you want to predict whether they're vegan or not. And so here, the borrow variable is a categorical variable. It's a string, but the string corresponds to like a category. There's like we know there's five boroughs, and so um, we want to encode this in some way that can go into our machine learning model. There are some uh, models that actually can deal with this directly, but mostly cannot. One way to convert a categorical variable to a number is to what's called ordinal encoding, and there are several ways to do this. For example, um, if you just use pandas, you can do dot s type category which converts the variable that was out of a string variable to a category variable. Dot cat has all the methods for categorical variables. And then if you do codes, codes will give you an integer encoding. So this is like, there's probably a more elegant way to do this with pandas, but this will give you an integer encoding of the categories. 
Um, so now you'd have boroughs, etc. of Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, you'll have zero, one, two, three. And uh, scikit-learn will no longer complain. Before, if you try to put this data frame into a model, the model would error. It will no longer error. The question is, is this a good way to do it? The answer is that it depends a little bit on the model. So usually this is not a very good idea, um, in particular if you have so few categories, because it um, enforces an ordering of the categories. So before, these are just like disjoint entities, but now they're ordered uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. In particular, if you look at um, the result of vegan as a function of this uh, ordinal borrow um, variable, then you can see that it's sort of, it's like non -monoton not monotonous, um, so it's vegan is zero for zero, it's one for one, and vegan is zero for two and three. Because in the data set, you're vegan if and, only live, if, if and only if you live in Brooklyn. So if I have a linear model that I want to um, build on this, a linear model will not be able to learn this concept. So if I encode a variable in this way, a linear model will not be able to learn. Um, so a different option is to uh, use what's called dummy encoding or one-hot encoding. And this is sort of the default way most people deal with categorical variables for most models. You can do this in pandas using get dummies. What get dummies will do is it will create a new column for each possible value of the categorical variable. So here the borrow column is replaced by four columns, borrow Bronx, borrow Brooklyn, borrow Manhattan, borrow Queens, and they're always zero except for one of them which corresponds to the actual category for that row, which, which is why it's called one-hot encoding. By default, get dummies will encode everything that has either object D-type, which is mostly strings, or that has categorical D-type. So here right now, this would have object D-type. Vegan also has object D-type, so it also automatically encodes vegan, even though we probably don't want to do that. You can specify, excuse me, mm, you can specify which columns to encode with the columns parameter and say, okay, I just wanna encode borrow. Uh, similarly, if someone was already very helpful and encoded the borrow as an integer, uh, by default it wouldn't be encoded, and again you can say borrow equal to, sorry, columns equal to borrow, and then it'll encode it. Uh, one issue is that very commonly if you get a data set, categorical variables m might be encoded as integers, and a priori it's impossible to know whether an integer represents a category or a continuous variable. So it is sort of our knowledge about the domain and about the data set that tells us borrow is clearly a categorical variable, whereas salary is a continuous variable. But uh, basically, if I, if I like, gave the salary not in thousands, but in like, give you all the digits, and then I renamed the column from salary to zip code, you will think it's categorical. If I rename it to salary, you'll think it's ca continuous, right? So it's really uh, something you know about the problem that tells you how you should whether you should treat a uh, variable as categorical or continuous. And it's not always entirely clear. For example, the uh, number of bathrooms or number of bedrooms, they're an ordinal variable. And so you could argue for either of them being continuous or categorical. There's a clear order to how many bathrooms, but uh, if you build a linear model, for example, then actually doing the one hot encoding might be beneficial for a linear model uh, to encode like the different values of having different numbers of bedrooms or bathrooms. So this is how you can do the one hot encoding with uh, pandas. There's one issue you can run into with uh, pandas, which is, let's say you did this um, dummy encoding on your training data set, and then later someone else gives you a new data set, a new CSV file or a new data frame, and you do the get dummies again. Um, now, 
if the categories are different. So here I have a different subset uh, of the borrowers represented, represented. The Bronx is not in the data set on the right, but Staten Island is. And so if I do the get dummies, the semantics of all of the columns will have changed. And so right now, if you now hand this to scikit-learn, it will just work, but give you garbage results. Um, there's basically three ways, oh my God, there's four ways around this. I mean, one is you can just make sure you have all the data and encode it together. If you have like, if you do doing Kaggle competitions, that works. If you do something in the real world, you never know if someone else might find some other data somewhere else. Um, there's an align columns command in pandas that is not on my slides because I just recently learned that this is a good way to do it. Um, the other way to do it is actually provide the categories explicitly. So you can say this borrow column is actually not just an object, it's a categorical column and I actually know what are the categories. If I provide the categories explicitly, um, so I say Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, and Staten Island are the categories, and then I call get dummies, then I will always get all of these categories represented in exactly the order that I provided. So if I know the categories, this way I can ensure they're encoded in a consistent way. And now I really need to speed up. That's annoying. Um, the other way to do this is the one hot encoder. So get dummies is sort of the pandas way to do it, and the one hot encoder is the second learn way to do it. Um, the pandas way is like slightly easier if you have just a single data frame, but if you have if you're working with training and test splits, like pandas doesn't really have a, a concept of training and test set, then it becomes a little bit more tricky, and you might want to do the one hot encoder. Um, the reason why one encoder is a little bit trickier to use is because it always transforms all columns. So if I give this data set that has the salary and the borrow to it, so I already removed the target because uh, for second learn you always remove the target. It will actually encode both the salary and the borrow. And there's no easy way uh, to not make it encode the salary. However, there's an amazing tool in scikit learn called the column transformer. The column transformer is um, a meta estimator similar to grid search and pipeline that allows you to plug together different transformers. But um, unlike the pipeline, it basically applies them in parallel to different subsets of the columns. So here I'm using make column transformer to create a transformer that applies the standard scalar to the continuous columns and the one hot encoder to the categorical columns. So you need to specify which column to treat which way. Um, what I did here is basically, I did, this is like a little bit of a hack. As I said earlier, there's no way for you to really know which columns should be categorical and which continuous unless you think about the data set and you think about the domain. But a quick hack is, Everything that's an object D type, these are the strings. I assume they're categorical and I assume the integers are all continuous. And so now I do this make column transformer um, with a standard scalar being applied to, so categorical now is a Boolean mask and I say not this Boolean mask and one hot encoder is applied to the categorical ones. And then I can put this inside a pipeline, say with like a classification or regression model. So this would be a like, pretty standard uh, workflow for working with scikit-learn, is you, you create a column transformer that has all your pre-processing over the different columns. Then you create a pipeline of your pre-processing with your supervised model. Maybe talking like, a little bit more about column transformer, so sort of visualizing what it does. So you can apply um, any transformation to any subset of columns. They don't need to be continuous and categorical. You can have any kind of subsets and the subsets can overlapping. They don't need to cover all the columns. They can be any arbitrary um, index, indexes or masks. And um, for each of them you specify transformations. For example, I could 
apply scaling and PCA to my continuous variables, um, and I can uh, apply one hot encoding to my categorical variables, and then uh, after the transformation, column transformer concatenates all of them together so that I have all the preprocessed uh, columns together in the end. So this is like a, a really useful tool and you probably always want to use column transformer um, unless you're being really lazy. Um, the point is that this now you have all the preprocessing really encapsulated in this scikit-learn estimator. You can put the scikit-learn estimator in the pipeline and so you can make sure that you really um, do proper preprocessing. It's all encapsulated within a single uh, scikit-learn estimator. Um, a little uh, note about dummy variables and collinearity. So the one-hot encoding is redundant in that the last column is one minus all the other columns, or one minus the sum of the other columns. If the first n minus one columns are not one, the last column will be one. If you already saw a one in the first n minus one columns, then the last column will be a zero. So this will introduce what's called uh, collinearity, basically a linear dependence between the features into the data set. And so if you so choose, you can drop one of them. For most models that we'll discuss in this class and sort of most machine learning models in general, this collinearity is not really a problem. I think there's exactly one model in scikit-learn for which this is a problem, it's called linear regression. And for none of the other pro uh, models, it's a problem. Uh, if, you, if you care more about inference and you work with more statistical models, collinearity can be more of a problem. Um, so both dummy, uh, get dummies and one hot encoder have an option to drop one of them. However, if you use like a penalized model um, or basically any machine learning model, the choice which one you drop matters and I think it makes it a little bit harder to interpret the model. So I usually keep all of them. All right, so there's some models that um, support uh, discrete features or categorical variables. So in principle, that's usually all the tree-based model and uh, sub-naive base models. In scikit-learn right now, there's a categorical naive base which supports categorical variable, but uh, nothing else. Um, hopefully soon, the decision trees, random forest, and gradient boosting will uh, all support categorical variables. So I think gradient boosting will do it in the next release, which might come out just after this class ends, probably. <coughs> So in this class, if you want to use scikit-learn, you have to still use um, one-hot encoding basically for everything. So there's uh, one more way to encode categorical variables that I want to talk about in the next 15 minutes, which is um, called target encoding or impact encoding. This is going back to the data set on um, house prices in the king in uh, king country, king's country, king's country. I think there was another feature I left out, which is zip code. So here's all the zip codes, and for each zip code, I have um, a bar plot of the. Sorry, I have a box plot of the price. And as you might imagine, there's cheaper neighborhoods and there's more expensive neighborhoods. Pretty sure downtown Seattle is more expensive than other areas. The question now is, how can we encode this feature? So there's, um, the two choices we've seen so far is like, oh, well, I guess we could, we could just treat it as an integer. We could drop it and not use it. Or we could um, do one hot encoding. If we treat it as an integer, and like, um, so I actually I didn't evaluate this because I want to use a linear model, and if I use a linear model, there's really not a linear relationship between zip codes and price. Like, why would there be? So I didn't do that. Um, but the problem is that one hot encoding doesn't work very well if there's very many categories. And I think there's about 70 different zip codes in this data set. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to use this target encoding. Um, 
So this will replace this one categorical feature again by just a single feature. This new feature will be the response encoded variable. And in this case here, it will be just the average price of a house in this zip code on the training set. So basically, for each of these, I compute the mean, and then I replace when the zip code with the mean price. There's like actually a slightly more to it. If we do this on the training set, we might overfit really hard on the training set. So usually like there you do something like you estimate this using cross validation uh, on the training set, or you just uh, add like some smoothing constant. So like if you add uh, like one or something, then you're usually fine. Um, but yeah, if you just compute it on a training set and encode the training set in the same way, uh, you might overfit too crazily. But um, in principle, what you're doing is you replace the categorical value by just the average response. For binary classification, you can do the same. Um, let's say you just look at the fraction of class one. If you have a multi-class problem, you look at the probability for each class, and then you get uh, multiple new features. So then you have as many features as there's classes in your multi-class problem. So if I do a 10 class classification, I would replace my zip code with um, the probability or the frequency of class zero in, the, in this zip code, the frequency of class one in this zip code, and so on. Uh, this is not in scikit-learn right now, hopefully it is soon. In the meantime, there's this uh, package called categorical encoding. Sorry. And uh, this has like many, many different ways to do categorical encoding. I think this uh, target encoding uh, or uh, leave one out encoding is like the cross validation variant form of this um, are probably the most useful ones. All right. so. Now I'm going to do this. I'm going to load my data set. Um, so as a base, so wait. Oh yeah. It also, this, this data set also has the date in it. I also ignored the date for now. Um, so what we're going to do is, here's the first five lines in the training set. I call train test split, so they're shuffled. And so you have the zip codes here. Um, and if I, I use a target encoder from this categorical encoding package, I say apply it to the column called zip code and fit it on the training data set. I transform the training data set and call head. And um, you can see now this zip code was encoded as this. So the zip code 90. 98029 was encoded at as oh my god what's 10 what's 10 to the 5 uh, is this 600,000 600,000 dollars and if you look at so here at the bottom i'm basically doing this computation again manually so on the training data set i do a group by the zip codes and i compute the mean and i can see then well for the zip code the mean was basically this. Like there's some small smoothing going on, but basically I replaced the feature by the mean over everything that has a zip code. All right, so now let's do a comparison. First one is to cross validation with ridge um, where I just dropped the zip code. This is sort of what we did in the very beginning. I'm actually, I'm not scaling here because I, earlier I, I saw that scaling didn't matter too much for rich. I should also probably do grid searches and all the other things, but I just do like a very cost comp coarse comparison. Um, and we get an R square of 0.69. Now I'm gonna do uh, the one hot encoder, which basically adds 70 new columns and um, Oh, so what I'm doing here is, I didn't uh, show this earlier, I think, for the make column transformer, I say, apply the one hot encoder to the zip code and the remainder is passed through. Meaning, 
take all the other columns. By default, it would just drop all the columns that are not mentioned. Remainder equal to pass through means uh, just keep all the columns that are not mentioned. So it, it 100 encodes the zip code and just keeps the rest. And now the score is uh, now a square of 0 0.52. So in this case, including this uh, variable as a 100 encoded uh, variable actually made it uh, quite a bit worse. And now, obviously, the target encoder, um, now I make a pipeline of the target encoder where target encode the zip uh, code I could also use the column transformer here, but I don't need to. Target, the target encoder automatically passes through everything that's not mentioned. And now the R square is um, 0 0.78. And so, ta-da, it helped a lot. So this is really, I think, one of the most useful ways to encode high, categorical, uh, high cardinality categorical variables. And so, there's also other things that, um, if we have more time, I'll maybe talk about um, in a couple of weeks. Like, um, I guess, uh, entity embedding is sort of the main thing, uh, or things based on the actual string values. But if you have one-hot encoding and you have target encoding, these are the, really the two most common, most powerful ways to encode categorical variables. All right. Um, maybe one last thing. So, I here I just showed you the make column transformer. There's also you can directly use the column transformer class, similar to as we did this with with pipeline. Make column transformer creates names automatically on the fly, whereas um, if you just call column transformer directly, you give it uh, a list of tuples, and the tuples will be name, um, estimator, and the columns to apply to. So similar to make pipeline, make column transformer, there's like a, a short version that generates names automatically and a long version that uh, allows you to name the things yourself. All right, so any questions? All right, then I'll see you Monday. <laughs>